All right, good morning. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. My name is Mary Leonard. I'm chair of the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, please note the text code on this uh, slide here um, to get your credit, CME credit, and we'll make sure that that's also available in the chat for your convenience as you get settled in. Uh, so excited about today's Grand Round speakers on development, implementation, and outcomes of clinical pathways, building on experience from acute kidney injury and heart transplantation. Seth and Claudia have been doing such beautiful work in this area, and I'm hoping that other uh, people from other disciplines or other divisions will think about opportunities to do similar work. This really provides a wonderful roadmap. Next slide. All right, and we could not be more lucky to have Catherine Edwards come speak to us about vaccine safety from um, Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She's really a thought leader in this field. I've been involved in a couple other national program committees that have been trying to get her to speak. She's very much in demand right now. And we were very fortunate to have, us, uh, have her join us next week. Next slide. And then we're gonna hear some more cardiology, hear about inherited heart conditions, what pediatric providers need to know, very distinguished lineup of speakers here, and especially having the, with the, all the genetics expertise, a very strong program here. Next slide. Um, and then some of you may know that the maternal fetal medicine program here got quite an extraordinary, um, dare I say, transformative a gift from the Dunleavies recently. And they're going to have a conference coming up soon, a center event on fetal therapy. And some of our faculty are involved in that work. Next slide. And please mark your calendar, do everything you can to attend this workshop. The Maternal and Child Health Research Institute over the last five years uh, under Mary Chen's leadership and building on the strengths that we already had um, in terms of clinical research support um, has now built out a very strong clinical research support office led by Carl Sylvester with extraordinary staff, CJO for research IT and Allison around operations. They interviewed well over a hundred investigators, did a whole fishbone analysis and then worked very effectively with the chief operating officer, chief nursing officer, chief informatics officer to break down a lot of barriers and untangle a lot of red tape to doing clinical research within Stanford Children's Health. So uh, anybody doing clinical research, your mentees, your clinical research coordinators, please be sure to attend one of these two workshops here. And then we anticipate that this will be a quarterly event, but this will be time well spent. Uh, next slide. And then I hope um, you've had a chance to learn about DRIVE. DRIVE is a program that maternal, the Maternal and Child Health Research Institute runs. We did our first one this last summer where underrepresented minority, first generation or low income undergraduate students spend a summer with us. Um, it was really wonderful to meet all the student participants, hear about their interests and then at the beginning of the summer and then to listen to their presentations at the end where they described great projects they did with our faculty um, and described everything they got out of the program. It was a tremendous success. We're looking to expand the program for next summer, but of course, just couldn't do it without the really generous faculty who took these students into their labs and the MCHRI probably <clears throat> pays the stipend for the students. So you can go to the website and learn more about this program, but we need the faculty mentors as we scale up. Uh, when I presented this to the other department chairs, they want to see this whole school of medicine wide. Um, but first, we're going to expand it next summer within um, child health, maternal and child health. Next slide. Okay, with that, I'm going to pass the baton to David Rosenthal, professor of pediatrics in the Division of Cardiology, to introduce today's speakers. Looking forward to it. Thank you, David. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Drs. Claudia Algazi and Seth Hollander. They are both valued colleagues and close friends. And um, almost as importantly, they're talking about heart transplantation. So I think it's gonna be a great start to the morning. But for those of you who haven't already met them, Dr. Algazi came to Stanford in 2007. She is currently a clinical assistant professor and the medical director of clinical effectiveness at LPCH. In this role, she's worked on numerous quality interventions, uh, including the development of target-based care and clinical pathways throughout the Heart Center. Dr. Hollander uh, joined the faculty in 2012 after completing residency at UCSF. He is the medical director of cardiac transplantation here at LPCH, a clinical associate professor in cardiology 
and has been a key figure in numerous clinical investigations concerning VAD care and heart transplantation. This morning, Dr. Zalgazi and Hollander will co-present recent work on prevention of renal injury after heart transplantation in children, and we'll discuss how this work can serve as a template for multidisciplinary pathway development and implementation. I'll turn it over to uh, you, Dr. Hollander. Uh, good morning, everybody, and um, thank you all for joining today on Zoom, and uh, thank you, Dr. Leonard and David, um, for the opportunity to speak today uh, at Grand Rounds. Um, I'd like to begin just by framing a little bit of what we're going to be talking about. Um, it's quite possible that many of you who are tuned in today are not necessarily interested in acute kidney injury, and it's quite possible that even fewer of you are interested in the nuances of pediatric heart transplantation. Uh, and I just want to begin by saying that that's fine, because today's talk is not going to be really about the nuances of either of those topics. What we're going to be talking about today is how we recognized an important clinical problem within an at-risk population, which happens to be heart transplant patients, and how we used a coordinated, multidisciplinary, and ultimately academic approach to reducing the incidence of that problem to make patients' uh, outcomes and ultimately their lives better. And so even if AKI is not your thing or heart transplant's not your thing, that's okay. I think there'll be uh, important lessons that you can take back to your own patient population um, to go ahead and give them better care. So on behalf of Dr. Uh, Claudia and myself, we have nothing to disclose. Um, but I, I do wanna start, I guess, in a bit of a strange place, which is with a confession. And, and that confession is when I come home after a long day at work, um, I like to binge watch reality TV. And maybe it's because I'm actually standing alone in an office that I feel brave enough confessing that. Um, but quite frankly, my family knows, my team knows, my chief knows because she loves below deck um, and my DVR definitely knows. So I guess now you guys know too that I love to binge watch Bravo TV in particular. And so um, if you're anything like me and I assume all of you are, you are currently obsessed right now with the season finale of Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. Um, this season has been absolutely fantastic. But, um, and feel free to give me a little thumbs up in the chat if you also have been watching. But in, in the event that one or two of you have not been watching Real Housewives of Beverly Hills this year, I just want to take one moment of precious Grand Rounds time to summarize what's been going on this season. I hope that's okay. So the, the main plot driver this season has centered around these two women. This is Erica Girardi and Sutton Strack, in case you don't know them. They are two wealthy women who live in Beverly Hills, like all of the other Real Housewives. And well, when the season began, Erica and Sutton were getting along great. They were going on walks together. They were bonding. They were recently had gone through a divorce and moved into new houses. They really had a nice friendship going on. But then somewhere mid-season, Erica got stressed out because of some financial problems. Sutton said something about Erica that she didn't like. Erica fired back and called Sutton a bad friend. And by mid-season, they hated each other hated each other and made really a career out of trying to destroy each other's lives. They would argue at dinner parties, they'd make each other cry, they would accuse each other of terrible things. Um, and for about half the season, all of the enjoyment was just watching these two women tear each other apart. And then in the second to last episode, just kind of out of nowhere, they more or less just dropped it. They were walking to a cocktail party on a yacht, they had a brief conversation, and then they decided like, they're just not going to fight anymore. Now, I'm not gonna go so far to say that Erica and Sutton are friends, but I think they've gotten to the point where they've resolved their differences so that they can live with this kind of quiet tension. Um, and it's been absolutely a delight to watch for whatever reason. And I, I think the reason I like The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills in this particular storyline is it's a classic tale of frenemies. And if you don't know what a frenemy is, it's a word, a portmanteau, which is a blend of two words. And um, a frenemy is a combination of a friend and enemy. And I think if we're honest, all of us have one or two frenemies in our lives. These are people we get along with, but um, it doesn't take too much for the whole thing to fall apart and to end up kind of at odds with this person. And then things get better and they become friends again. And the friendship sort of oscillates between getting along and not getting along. And uh, this is a nice tale of frenemies. Uh, now, I think it's entirely possible that many of you watching are wondering why a grown person with an important job and a family would spend his time watching a ridiculous and silly show. Um, but the truth is it's much worse than that because there are many Real Housewives shows. There's New York, Atlanta, Melbourne, Dallas, Saint, uh, um, Salt Lake City. I, I, watch, I watch them all. And the show has been going on for more than 10 years. So there's hundreds and hundreds of these episodes that I've spent my time watching. 
Um, but in the event that you haven't been wasting your time watching these shows, it's, it's really easy for me to summarize them because quite frankly, every episode of every show of every Real Housewives franchise is in fact exactly the same. They're all tales of frenemies. And so I can begin by day by summarizing all of Real Housewives in one slide. And I call it the frenemy criteria. So the frenemy criteria or every plot of every Real Housewives show goes like this. Two characters start out as friends, everything's going fine then something stresses the system, something bothers them. And then all the characters all of a sudden go into survival mode. And when they go into survival mode, they end up fighting like hell and making each other's lives miserable for about two thirds of the season. And then for some reason, inexplicably by the end of the season, they kind of work things out and everybody moves on. But you know it's gonna happen again. And then you watch it again. And that's basically what happens every time you watch a Real Housewives show. And so, as I mentioned before, this is the way I kind of quiet my brain after a long, busy day at work. Um, and I seem to be getting busier and busier. As one of the heart transplant cardiologists here, um, we have a lot to do. We have been performing pediatric heart transplantations contiguously at this institution at Stanford since 1974, nearly 50 years. We're now performing regularly between 25 and 30 heart transplants a year, where 10, 15 years ago, we were maybe doing half of that. I'm happy to announce in this venue that we recently performed our 500th pediatric heart transplant here and have blown past that number uh, and our patients doing great. And so we're doing more and more heart transplants every single year. But not only are we doing more heart transplants, our patients are living for a long time and it's not unusual for patients to live 10, 20, even 30 years after their heart transplant. And so we seem to be accumulating more and more patients and that makes us very busy. And as we do more heart transplants, we get better at it and our patients live longer and longer. And so if you look at this Kaplan-Meier survival curve, comparing our first 25 years of heart transplant with our most recent 21, you'll see that our survival is getting better, particularly our early and midterm survival. And so our patients are not only coming to us more frequently for more transplantations to happen here, um, these patients are living longer and longer. And as we've moved through the 50 year story of heart transplant, something very interesting has happened. And that is the expectations that we have of ourselves and quite frankly, the expectations our patients have of us have changed. Simply surviving after your heart transplant is no longer good enough. Patients wanna do more than just be alive. They really wanna live. And if you look at the literature over the 50 years of the heart transplant story, you actually see the beginning of a fading away of literature focusing strictly on patient survival and really increasing literature on things like quality of life and scholastic performance and functional status, things to make long-term longevity more tolerable and better for the patients, not simply to improve survival. And this is a good problem to have. One of the dominant themes in this type of literature centers around the preservation of renal function, not only in heart transplant patients, but non-renal solid organ transplant patients overall. And so part of giving a patient a good outcome these days is giving them a good renal outcome. So why would we be so, would we be so focused on renal outcomes and heart transplantation? Well, it turns out that historically, renal outcomes and heart transplantation have been quite poor. Um, this is an important study from about 10, 12 years ago from I'm Brian Feingold in Pittsburgh using the Pediatric Heart Transplant Study Database, clearly demonstrating that as the years follow after a pediatric heart transplant, renal function declines year after year after year. Um, it turns out that having a sick heart is not very good for your kidneys. And interestingly, the converse is also true too. Having a sick kidney is not good for your heart. And so as it turns out, just like Erica and Sutton, the heart and the kidney are frenemies for sure. They only get along when things are going fine. So just for fun, let's, let's apply the Real Housewives criteria to the cardiorenal syndrome. The heart and the kidneys are friends as long as everything is going well. Good heart function, good kidney function, nothing to worry about. But then something stresses the system, kind of like a heart transplant, for example. And all of a sudden, both organs go into survival mode through things like fluid retention and vasoconstriction. And then the heart and the kidney decide to make each other's lives miserable for a period of time through things like diastolic heart failure and renal tubular acidosis and intrinsic kidney injury. And then if you're talking about acute kidney injury specifically, it always finds a way to work itself out and your creatinine normalizes and everybody decides to move on. 
of course, until it happens again and you develop chronic kidney disease. Now, it shouldn't really surprise you that the heart and the kidney are frenemies because quite frankly, the heart has a lot of frenemies out there. The heart and the liver, definitely frenemies. We see Fontan associated liver disease. We've now performed 15 heart and liver transplants because of the havoc that the heart wreaks on the liver. The heart and the lungs, definitely frenemies. Chronic lung disease occurs in about 50% 50, 50 of single ventricle adults. And the heart and the brain, don't even get me started. Uh, new, inferior neurodevelopmental outcomes are clearly demonstrated in patients with congenital heart disease. And so it turns out that the heart has trouble getting along with a lot of organs in the body. And if you think about it, lots of organs have trouble getting along with other organs in the body. And that's because the human body is an integrated system. It is not just a collection of organs operating independently like machines, it's an integrated system. And like all integrated systems, when each of the components is doing well, the system does well. But also like other integrated systems, when one of the components doesn't go well, things tend to fall apart. And so therefore it should not be surprising to you why a cardiologist is giving grand rounds on kidney injury. And so the topic for the day is acute kidney injury specifically. So what is acute kidney injury? So acute kidney injury is defined as an abrupt loss of kidney function or an abrupt kidney dysfunction episode. It occurs in about one of 20 of all children, but 70% of kids who are critically ill and nearly half of children undergoing surgery for congenital heart disease. And very interestingly, and apropos of our theme today, it most often occurs in kids who do not have primary kidney disease which is to say that AKI is not necessarily a disease of nephrologists. It's a disease that all of us will encounter in patients who primarily don't have kidney disease. And so it's for all of us to understand and recognize. There are many ways to uh, define or stage acute kidney injury or AKI, but for the purposes of today's discussion, we use something called the KDGO criteria. Um, and it's quite simple. If you have a doubling of your creatinine, then you are said to have at least stage two kidney injury. And if you triple your creatinine, you have stage three kidney injury. And it's a little more nuanced than that, but that doesn't really matter. So for example, if you have a creatinine of 0 0.6 going into your heart transplant and two days after your heart transplant, your creatinine is 1.3, then you are said to have stage two or severe kidney injury. And that's our target for today. So <clears throat> why is kidney injury important, right? If by definition, acute kidney injury typically resolves and it's an abrupt discrete episode, then why is it important? Well, it turns out that AKI is very important. Uh, kids who are critically ill who have AKI have longer ICU days and longer ventilator days, particularly if they have severe kidney injury. Um, and AKI stage two and stage three, as you can see here, is associated with inferior survival in ICU critically ill patients. In patients who do survive, AKI episodes, particularly severe ones, are associated with the development of CKD or chronic kidney disease. So it turns out if you have early hits to your kidneys, then you can develop long-term kidney dysfunction. Um, and why would that be? So theoretically, if you have an AKI episode and your creatinine resolves, you can assume that your kidneys had some sort of temporary injury that then resolved. Um, and that's true. But the resolution of the injury to the kidneys is not always adaptive. It can be maladaptive. And you can end up having a series of inflammatory and maladaptive responses to kidney injury that can long, lead to long-term permanent damage and CKD. And so we're starting to see and starting to really understand the connection between discrete acute kidney episodes, acute kidney injury episodes, and the subsequent development of chronic kidney disease. But I'm a cardiologist, so I'm not interested just in critically ill patients, I'm interested in cardiac patients. So the natural next question, of course, would be, are kids who have cardiac surgery at particular risk for developing AKI? Well, think of all the things that we do to cardiac patients. Number one, they're subject to chronic hypoxia, particularly if you have a mixing lesion where you live with a baseline oxygen saturation of 80% or so. We put them through cardiopulmonary bypass, which is inflammatory and uh, alters your hemodynamics. Um, we also cool the patients to 32, 31, sometimes 29 degrees um, in, while doing cardiac surgery. And hypothermia is associated with a number of events that are not good for the kidneys. And then of course, after cardiac surgery, they have altered post-operative hemodynamics, but post-operative low cardiac output syndrome, sometimes we call it the post-pump slump. And that often takes the form of low blood pressure or lower arterial blood pressure 
and or higher central venous pressure. And we know that if you have low arterial blood pressure and or high central venous pressures, then you're gonna have decreased blood flow across the kidneys because your arterial blood pressure is gonna be the same as your renal artery blood pressure in most cases. And your central venous pressure is gonna be the same as your renal vein pressure in most cases. And if you have a decreased pressure gradient across the kidney, then you're going to have decreased blood flow across the kidney, and that's not good. And so cardiac surgery patients seem to have a lot of risk factors for developing AKI. And so the question is, do they develop AKI? And there's actually a lot of studies to suggest that they do. So in a study that Claudia did here with um, some of our colleagues, she demonstrated very clearly that post-operative Fontan patients who have lower transrenal gradients, that is lower mean arterial blood pressure and or higher central venous pressures, have higher incidences of acute kidney injury. And if you look at which patients these are, these are the patients that require a lot of inotropes after cardiac surgery. So patients who are on dopamine, epinephrine, melatonin at higher doses or for a longer period of time, these are the patients who I think we can presume have altered hemodynamics as a result of their surgery. And these are the patients in whom we see acute kidney injury in the first few days after a cardiac surgery. But the AKI usually resolves, so why does it matter? Well, it turns out that in congenital heart surgery patients in particular, when you have acute cardiac injury associated with your surgery, that is a setup for you developing later stage chronic kidney disease. And so the point is that AKI in cardiac surgery patients really should be avoided, not only for acute reasons, but really for long-term renal outcomes. But of course, I'm a heart transplant cardiologist, and so I don't take care of that many patients going through traditional cardiac surgery anymore. So the next question that would be natural to ask is, are heart transplant patients at the same risk as cardiac surgery patients? Well, if you think about it, heart transplant patients have all of the risk factors that cardiac surgery patients have for acute kidney injury, plus some that are particular to their own condition. So as I mentioned before, cardiac surgery patients are subject to chronic hypoxia. They have surgery that requires cardiopulmonary bypass. The body is cooled during surgery. They can have altered hemodynamics intraoperatively and postoperatively that can affect renal perfusion. However, if the cardiac surgery you're getting happens to be a heart transplant, you're likely dealing with a patient who's had heart failure for a long time, right? There's a reason they got a heart transplant and heart failure is not good for the kidneys. Plus um, the organ that they have is subject to ischemia. While the organ is being removed from the donor and transported to the recipient, we know that that heart will sustain an ischemic injury, which often leads to post-transplant, post-operative systolic and often diastolic dysfunction, which are going to alter your hemodynamics in a way that disfavors um, renal recovery. And then of course, if you get through all of that okay, um, we send you home on things like cyclosporin or tacrolimus, nephrotoxic medications, which can really prolong renal injury far beyond the post-operative period. And so I think it's very reasonable to hypothesize that heart transplant patients are at individual and in particular increased risk for developing AKI. And as a result, there's been this flurry of literature over the last 10 years demonstrating that heart transplant patients have an acute kidney injury risk anywhere between 60 and 75%. Um, and this is true also for other solid organ transplant patients. And so we started to get concerned here that maybe our patients were also having AKI episodes and maybe at an alarming rate. And so in 2016, um, under the mentorship of Scott Sutherland, we took a look at this. And we looked at a cohort of 88 of our heart transplant patients, consecutive heart transplant patients from a recent cohort, and found that 72% of our heart transplant patients were having AKI within seven days of their transplant, 72%. Now, it's almost hard to call that a complication when it happens in nearly every patient, right? It's hard to say that it's a complication when it was something we more or less at this point expected to happen. Nearly half of the AKI we saw was severe, which means that patients were routinely doubling their creatinine not only within the first few days post-transplant, but often within the first two days post-transplant. We also found that only about half of the patients who had AKI recovered. And so we found that a number of patients at three months post-transplant still had elevated creatinines, and that those patients who failed to recover by three months had a very high incidence of having chronic kidney disease at one year post-transplant. So not only was AKI highly prevalent in our patients, we found that it really had a lasting effect that could potentially affect long-term outcomes. And so we thought this was an opportunity to intervene. If the AKI was happening within the first days, few days after the transplant, then maybe that should be our target. And that seemed to be a good idea because if you look at the 
trajectory of a heart transplant patient. There's many phases of care. And that literature I've shown you from the last 10 years has really focused on this first phase of care, the pre-transplant status, and has done a very good job of identifying several risk factors for acute kidney injury in the pre-transplant phase. So things like if the patients are on a ventilator or if they have renal dysfunction as a result of their heart failure before their transplant, these patients we know are at increased risk for developing AKI. But the problem is that these risk factors are not modifiable, right? You're not going to fail to intubate a patient just because you're worried they're gonna have AKI after the transplant. And so although we thought these risk factors were important, we didn't think they were a good area of study because quite frankly, if we found the risk factors, what were we going to do about them anyway? So the other place we could look is late after transplant. So we know that things like being on nephrotoxic medications or having multiple rejection episodes, or if your heart transplant um, becomes dysfunctional, then you can have AKI episodes as associated with that. That's well established. But quite frankly, by then it's too late. That's not where you wanna intervene. So that was not a good area of intervention if we in fact wanted to make a difference. And so Claudia and Scott and a bunch of us decided to focus on the perioperative period. So what happens during surgery and in the postoperative CVICU phase that could be causing AKI that we could also do something about? And so we got interested in things like hemodynamics, as I've shown you before with the congenital heart surgery patients or renal oxygenation during surgery or body temperature. Also, what medications should we be giving? What medications should we not be giving that could potentially alter someone's risk for developing AKI to improve their outcomes? And the hypothesis is this, is that when you have a heart transplant, you can enter into a very vicious cycle that can lead to prolonged kidney injury. So as I mentioned before, as the heart is removed from the donor body and transported as the recipient, it by definition is going to undergo an ischemic injury, right? There's going to be an ischemic injury to the donor heart. And typically the way that the heart responds to that is through having diastolic heart failure. And so as most of you know, we perform a lot of cardiac catheterizations in these patients, and it's not unusual to see diastolic filling pressures, you know, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 after transplant when normally these should be single digit numbers. So what happens when you have diastolic heart failure? Well, you develop venous congestion, right? You develop high central venous pressures. And when you develop high central venous pressures, you end up reducing that transrenal gradient and having decreased renal perfusion. And when you have decreased renal perfusion, you have decreased urine output. And what happens when you have decreased urine output is you become increasingly congested. That stretches the heart and causes further injury to the heart and per per perpetuating the cycle of ischemic injury to the heart and um, renal dysfunction. And so we thought we would look here. And so we performed a study here in the last few years where we looked at about 99 of our heart transplant patients and specifically drilled down on intraoperative and postoperative risk factors for AKI, but also looked at whether or not these patients who had AKI had worse outcomes in the forms of things like ventilator days or ICU days or even post-transplant mortality. And when we looked, we were glad to find that there were several modifiable risk factors for AKI. So our patients who had AKI had lower cardiac index during the operation. They were cooled to lower temperatures in general. Um, they had higher hematocrits was really interesting and that their renal nears or their renal arterial oxygen saturations were also lower. So there were a number of things that happened into the, in the operating room that seemed to be risk factors for developing AKI in the first seven days after heart transplant. When you looked at the first 48 hours postoperatively, we found exactly what we thought we would find, which is that hemodynamics that disfavor renal blood flow lead to acute kidney injury. So patients who had higher central venous pressures after transplant had higher AKI rates. Patients who had lower uh, mean arterial blood pressures or lower diastolic blood pressures also, because of that redu reduction in renal blood flow, seem to be having more AKI events. And so if you graph out the hemodynamics of a CVICU patient after a heart transplant, you can see here that the patients who had acute kidney injury depicted in black had lower systolic blood pressures, lower diastolic blood pressures, lower mean arterial blood pressures, and higher central venous pressures. And this was very exciting for us because we could then identify a target in which we could potentially make a difference. And so we took all of these and we plugged these into a multivariable model so we could figure out what were the relative contributions of each of these disturbances on acute kidney injury incidence. And we were shocked to find just how significant it was. Patients who had a mean central venous pressure greater than 12, or patients who had a mean arterial pressure less than 65 after heart transplant were nearly at five times the risk of developing AKI, five times the risk 
In patients who had renal NEARS data, patients who had a renal oxygen saturation less than 65% were nearly nine times more likely to develop AKI after transplant. And so we got very excited because we started to identify things that maybe we could do something about. And so the next natural question is, well, how important is it to do something about this? Again, AKI goes away, what's the difference? And so when we looked at our outcomes, we were very impressed to find that patients who had AKI had longer days on the ventilator, more days in the ICU after transplant, more days in the hospital after their transplant, and were seven times more likely to die by the end of the data collection period. When we looked at this actuarially, we found that patients who had even a single AKI episode after transplant were much more likely to die than patients who did not. And so what we hypothesized was AKI was not just a risk factor for early perioperative morbidity, it really set off a cascade that led to reduced survival in patients. And I'll remind you, the median survival of a heart transplant patient these days is 10, 15, in some populations, almost 20 years. And we're losing patients at five, six years post-transplant. And it seems to be that one of the warning signs is the development of acute kidney injury. And so we became highly motivated to see if we can possibly reduce the incidence. And so if there's one lesson I'd really like to put forward, particularly to the trainees or people who are starting a clinical research career today, it's that clinical research should lead to better care. We all want to discover things. We all want to study our area of interest and we all want to publish papers. Um, but the truth is what we really want to do is make patients better. And so when we do our clinical research and we're designing a question, I'd really encourage all of you to design a question from which the answer might allow you to change your practice to actually make things better at the patient level. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here. So how to go about solving this problem, right? This is a major problem. How do we go about solving it? Well, one thing that makes solving this problem complicated is that a heart transplant patient doesn't belong to just one doctor or one service. They pass through many different services. They are not just a surgery patient. They're not just an anesthesia patient. They're not just a cardiology patient. They're not just a CVIC patient. They are passing through many phases of our complicated hospital system. And just like the human body itself, our hospital system needs to be an integrated system. We are not a series of doctors and nurses and other providers operating independently. We should be behaving in a way that is integrated. And so if we were going to solve this problem of acute kidney injury and heart transplant, then we needed to approach it in an integrated way, in a way that gets buy-in from everybody taking care of these heart transplant patients. And so that's what we set out to do. So with that, hopefully I've established what we were trying to get out. And it's my pleasure now to um, yield things over to Claudia, who's going to share with you um, how we developed the pathway and how um, we tried to make it work. Um, so thank you very much for your attention and I'll stop sharing now, Claudia. Um, so thank you, Seth, for uh, that uh, lovely background and setup for the next phase of this talk, which is really talking about in how we used a renal protection clinical pathway to improve perioperative acute kidney um, injury. Let's start with some definitions. So a clinical pathway is a tool that's used to translate evidence and consensus into clinical processes of care. And it's done within a unique culture and an environment of a specific healthcare institution. It really details steps in a course of treatment or some type of plan of care and aims to standardize care for a specific clinical population um, and a, with a specific clinical problem. Clinical pathways have been a longstanding source of a pro-con debate. Here are some examples. They're back. Once out of favor, clinical pathways are surging. Pathways are the holy grail to reduce errors and cost. Clinical pathways lead to high value care. We develop the treatments, so we don't need the pathways. We know what to do. Pathways create an unnecessary time burden in an already busy system. But here's probably the most provocative quote I found from a physician when talking about clinical pathways. There is an expectation that patients, that is, people, will follow pre-planned, coordinated, and arranged routes, a little like the movement of sausages or boxes or motor cars in a factory. People, oddly, aren't like boxes. The neat pathway you have constructed 
spent many hours fiddling with on the computer. Just won't work. On the surface, the path to a clinical pathway seems pretty straightforward. You select the clinical population, you gather a team, develop the clinical pathways, socialize, train, and educate, implement, and measure and improve. But it's anything but straightforward. And as we saw in the comments from the naysayers against clinical pathways, and as we see from a meta-analysis that was published in 2010, there are many facilitators and actually many more barriers to successful or failed pathway implementation at the design level, the implementation level, which you can see are pretty dense, and at the evaluation. So I'm not showing this slide for us to go through it in any detail, but just to show that there is rich evidence around what constitutes successful pathway design, implementation, and evaluation, and what are the multitude of pitfalls that we can fall into um, when embarking on this journey. Here are some guiding principles to try and distill one of that, that big slide. Select the population strategically. So Seth showed us in beautiful slides why looking at AKI in heart transplant patients and really in other perioperative scenarios is really important. There's a current state that um, is begging for improvement. There are gaps and opportunities, and it really aligns with the department, division, and institutional goals, which is uh, actually quite important in securing resources and engagement for the work. Define the multidisciplinary team and do it early. One of the most salient things we see from the literature is that the voice of nurses is largely absent in the development of pathways, but then they're asked to enact a lot of the pathway content, and that can lead to real failed implementation. Focus the content on evidence. And as we see in a lot of pediatric cases here where there is lack of evidence, seek wide consensus. Avoid overprescription. And this is key because a lot of the literature that shows why uh, physicians who do not follow clinical pathways, what their reason is, is that they are overprescriptive and they don't allow for their art in medicine type of practice. So allow for variation, but capture that variation and apply the learnings toward improve that, improving that clinical pathway. And practice active implementation. We saw in the previous slide a lot of pitfalls around what could lead to failed implementation. Some of the guiding principles are to integrate these into existing processes, recruit champions early, really be available, and obtain and respond to feedback. And finally, evaluate, iterate, and adapt. So this will include looking at key outcomes, process measures, and balancing measures. And we'll look at some examples. It's worth noting some literature that comes out of behavioral economics around successful implementation, in particular, health behavioral economics. In this book, Nudge, written by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, as well as an associated framework called the EAST framework, easy, attractive, social, and timely, really highlights some ways that we can leverage behavioral economics uh, for successful implementation. And the picture here of the mom and baby elephant is actually quite emblematic. The mom is leading the baby, but the baby still has freedom to choose the direction, although guided by the mom. Counter that to a picture in your mind of a kangaroo where the baby is within the mom and really has no freedom of choice. Those type of interventions are associated with less successful um, outcomes. Let's look at the renal protection clinical pathway. So it's multidisciplinary as Seth alluded to and includes from all levels of providers, heart transplant, pharmacy, anesthesia, nephrology, cardiac ICU, CV surgery, and perfusion. Let's examine the renal protective clinical pathway. Note that it's quite simple and it's not prescriptive. So it allows for flexibility and evaluation of the variation. It en encompasses modified immunosuppression. So administering rapid antithymocyte globulin over seven post-operative days instead of five days, which is the typical approach, allows prolonged T-cell suppressive effect 
and allows us to delay the initiation of dacrolimus, which is a known nephrotoxic agent. Secondly, leveraging the hemodynamic principles that Seth discussed, um, optimizing renal perfusion pressure is a major goal. So maintaining normal blood pressure and central venous pressure to improve that renal perfusion pressure is recommended in the clinical pathway um, through titration of inotropes and vasoactive medications, diuretic management, and fluid administration. But again, this area is not prescriptive, allowing for us to understand what are best practices that are occurring within our providers and apply those best practices in future adaptations of clinical pathways. Uh, prophylaxis ag agents, aminophilin administered in the uh, preoperative, intraoperative, and 48 hours postoperative was also enacted within this clinical pathway. And I'll talk about that in, in future slides because it's interesting to note. And nephrotoxic agent avoidance, which is clearly evidence-based and was enacted through this pathway by providing a list of nephrotoxic agents to avoid. Let's look a little bit at the implementation strategy, and I'll have us remember the framework that I showed you from behavioral economics. Make it easy, make it attractive, socialize it, and make it timely. So these are the factors that we try to do when implementing the renal protection pathway. It started, the story started at transplant selection meeting where the renal protection pathway content was discussed um, and documented into a flight plan. And that was followed and reinforced by patient and during patient review meeting, which occurred on a weekly basis. In a timely manner, the flight plan discussion, including specific renal protection pathway activities were discussed on the day of transplant. And then further reinforced in OR to ICU handoff. So this was an opportunity for the anesthesia and surgical team to recount the intraoperative details and then help outline the post-op plan for the uh, multidisciplinary team. And then this is further reinforced daily in ICU rounds, as well as integrated into progress notes using smart phrases to really trickle down to all members of the clinical team. Really importantly, you can see these arrows feedback. So all the information that we're learning with every patient journey into all the areas where we're discussing this so we can adapt and improve our pathway continuously. Let's look at some evaluation strategies. I talked about outcome, process, and balancing measures. Here they are. We looked at the incidence and severity of acute kidney injury, of course. Really importantly is we have a robust set of process measures, and I'll go through these in detail. But process measures are known in the literature to be probably more important than any other measure when looking at clinical pathway work because they help you improve upon the key drivers toward an improvement of an outcome. And balancing measures that really allow us to examine unintended consequences to a specific action include post-transplant in-person mortality and frequency of rejection. So in evaluating this, we are um, close to having this published in pediatric transplantation, which is it's under production. We included patients undergoing heart transplant at LPCH Stanford for within a, a two-year pre-pathway period and a two-and-a-half-year pathway period of evaluation using a quasi-experimental, non-randomized, pre-post intervention analysis. The analysis included 42 baseline patients and 52 pathway patients. Here's an overview of the results, looking at incidence and severity of acute kidney injury. You can see that the incidence of AKI was reduced by 20% with a p-value of 0 0.05, and the incidence of severe AKI defined by stage 2-3 AKI was reduced by 17% with a p-value of 0 0.09. When looking at this, at this in a multivariable fashion, after adjusting for age at time of surgery, bypass time, and preoperative creatinine clearance, the clinical pathway era, 
CVP or central venous pressure less than or equal to 12 millimeters of mercury and the mean arterial pressure of greater than 60 millimeters of mercury was ind were independently associated with avoidance of stage 2-3 AKI. And you can see the p-values in 95% confidence intervals associated here. Let's examine the process measures. As I mentioned, they're probably the most important measures to look at when looking at cl clinical pathways. Here, we're looking at a modified statistical process control chart where the consecutive patients are listed in the x-axis and the number of pathway bundle component elements are listed in the y-axis. So you can see before the clinical pathway, uh, in reference to an, after the clinical pathway, there was an improvement in compliance or adherence to clinical pathway bundle elements. But if we looked at this alone, we really would have a complete vision of what occurred within this clinical pathway. And unfortunately, when you review clinical literature around clinical pathways, this is where people generally stop reporting. We wanted to go a little bit further and look at each and what learnings we could have um, from each of the components of the clinical pathway. So let's look at these in a little bit of detail. Well, let's start with aminophilin uh, here at the top. So aminophilin, as we mentioned before, was one of the pharmacoprophylactic agents. It's recommended within the pathway to start a little bit before the transplant intraoperatively and then 48 hours post-transplant. The data around aminophilin is not conclusive in, in the general population for prevention of, of AKI. It is for some select populations. So it's very interesting that we were able to see a significant increase in the adherence of aminophilin use. It's likely attributed to the fact that there's really not a lot of downside to using aminophilin. It was approached from an implementation perspective in an easy, social, and attractive and timely way. So it really highlights the effective implementation strategy in, in the use of this medication. Let's look at delayed valgancyclovir. That's here in the middle. Delayed valgancyclovir had really high utilization even before the pathway started and after. So it's interesting to note that our practice didn't really change or rather that our clinical pathway did not impact practice in this way. Let's look at the hemodynamic ones, systolic blood pressure between 50 and 75th percentile and maintaining a central venous pressure of equal to or less than 12 millimeters of mercury. So because the combination of a variable adherence that you can see here um, to those recommendations and the data that we showed before that maintaining blood pressure and CVP under control is associated with reduction in AKI that was statistically significant, we are really now honing in on how we can fine tune the recommendations within this pathway toward the improvement of, of these two hemodynamic measures. How can we look at the intraoperative strategies and systematically improve those? For example, fluid management, mean arterial blood pressure management. How can we look at fluid management and vasoactive support in the immediate post-operative period to try and help us improve those goals? There's a different story in the delayed um, tacrolimus and extended rabbit antithymocyte globulin that you see here um, in the second and third rows. So there is re less relative adherence to providing extended rabbit antithymocyte globulin, as well as delayed tacro. How did this occur? So this is also reflective of our ability to learn from the early pathway experience and adapt. What we noticed is that about a year after implementation of this pathway, there were concerns that were voiced about this approach. What about, what's the benefit of of this strategy in patients with really low risk for AKI and who are not exhibiting AKI in the early period. And so in examining the potential lack of benefit of this strategy in those patients, the approach was modified so that patients with low risk AKI and who are not exhibiting early AKI will not get delayed 
um, rabbit anti-thymocyte globulin and can proceed with a little bit earlier delayed TACRO. So examining the system in a really robust, comprehensive way through um, process measures can really help us elucidate where to improve and then where to scale back. In, in examining balancing measures, I mentioned we looked at in-hospital mortality and rejection within the first year of transplant and noticed no adverse consequences to these measures. So if I can leave you with one thing, it is to re-examine the quote that was mentioned by the physician earlier on in the slides. But I didn't give you the full quote at the beginning. Let's look at that now. Remember he said, there is an expectation that patients, that is people, will follow pre-planned, coordinated and arranged routes, a little like the movement of sausages or boxes or motor cars in a factory. People oddly aren't like boxes. The neat pathway you have constructed, spent many hours fiddling with on the computer, just won't work. And here he adds, you need to move the pathway to where the person is standing, adjust the light to what they need, taper the medications and adapt. So if I could leave this group with one final comment, it is that pathways should be dynamic. They should be a continuous learning system in which we use the data that we're learning and continue to iterate and improve. And with that, we'll close this talk and open it up to discussion and questions with special thanks in alphabetical order to David Kwiatkowski, Katz Maeda, Tristan Margitson, Manchula Navratnam, Elizabeth Price, Sushma Reddy, David Rosenthal, Sarah Samref, Scott Sutherland, Jeffrey Yang, and Nina Zook, who all supported and took part in this multidisciplinary renal protective protocol. Thank you. Thank you, Seth and Claudia, for a very provocative presentation. We have a a few questions that have come in already, and I'll ask everybody in the audience to please submit their questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, the first that came through was a request for Seth to show again the slides of the cycle of injury and the CVP and NIRS data. Okay, can everyone see it? Okay, um, and the CVP and NIRS data was asked to uh, reshow as well. Sure, so yeah, now part of the problem is prior, when we did the study, not every patient was getting a renal nears placed at the time of transplant. And one of the nice things about doing research kind of in a quality pathway domain is when we discovered just how instructive the nears information was, the use of nears in the operating room uh, went up. And my understanding is it's used essentially universally now. Um, because we didn't really have this data when we started the pathway, it wasn't officially part of the pathway. Um, but is going to be incorporated in our second version of the pathway. Thank you. Uh, the next question, it sounds like AKI in these patients is due to loss of renal autoregulation and that the proposed solution is to compensate for this by increasing arterial and reducing venous pressure. Is the loss of autoregulation related to chronic heart failure before transplantation and could this be obviated by earlier transplantation? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's a, a little bit outside the scope of what we're talking about. Um, what I will say historically, particularly with patients who are getting ventricular assist devices, um, in the, the quote unquote old days when I was a fellow and when the risk profile of VADs was much higher, um, we often didn't place them until we saw signs of end organ dysfunction, usually in the form of elevated creatinine. Um, but what we've learned over the years is that that's too late. And so I would say in general, our treatment of heart failure is to stay on top of the AKI and to make interventions prior to AKI episodes um, to, to, to afford a good circulation. Um, in terms of the etiology, it's a little bit interesting and it's probably multifactorial. Um, we did a study, which we did not talk about in this particular talk about VAD patients. And what we found was that when patients get ventricular assist devices, uh, a certain percentage of them improve their renal function within 30 days of getting the VAD, and a certain percentage of them decrease their renal function within 30, about 30 days after they get the VAD. 
And the patients whose renal function goes down after the VAD actually have a very high rate of requiring dialysis a year after their transplant. And so the conclusion was that if your renal dysfunction was really a result of your heart being bad and you were just not getting enough renal blood flow, then things should improve with your VAD and they do. And the problem really wasn't your kidneys. The problem was that the kidney had a frenemy, which was the heart. If you restore the circulation with the VAD and the kidney function doesn't get better, then the problem is the kidney itself. And the assumption is that there actually is on, there's actually intrinsic kidney injury from having the heart failure and that those patients have real and true kidney disease that you can't blame on the heart. And those patients require uh, extra kind of monitoring and more ginger care to um, prevent kind of later and more serious, serious chronic kidney disease. Oh, the next question. Uh, how willing were patients and parents to participate in the research and was there fear about changing the existing treatment protocol? And I might sort of reframe this more broadly as what are the differences between implementing a clinical pathway and a research protocol? How do you tell which one you're doing and how do you approach patients about those things? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. And uh, people spend a lot of time trying to distinguish the line between research and quality improvement. And it's often a difficult line to follow or a difficult line to draw. Um, the one thing I would say is that this clinical pathway was designed not to answer a research question, but to change and improve clinical practice. And that's probably one of the deciding factors is uh, to determine whether you, you need to go down a research route in terms of IRB and patient uh, co informed consent or to proceed um, down a quality improvement route. In this case, I think Seth can speak a little bit to the major um, modification of a modified um, approach to immunosuppression, which I think the question is, is largely alluding to. But this was a quality improvement project with consensus and evidence base built into the clinical pathway. So it was not actually designed as a research protocol and did not require patient informed consent. So Seth, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the reasons that we felt comfortable proceeding without you know, addressing this as a research question. Yeah, no, it's a good it's a good point, and I would say one of the conveniences of doing pediatric heart transplantation is that the standard of care is much less well established than in other disciplines compared to, let's say, an appendectomy, which was first described by McBurney in the 1800s. Um, every center has its own practices, and there's actually data to show that center variation is very wide. Um, and so some centers actually do ATG of different doses at different schedules and ours of doing a specific dose at five consecutive days was quite frankly, just one of many appropriate ways to do it. And so we didn't feel that extending the ATG, for example, over a seven day schedule was really a major deviation from any accepted standard. Um, we just thought it was a clinical decision. Uh, similarly, providing the CVICU with a list of medications we would prefer them to avoid, like vancomycin if they could in the first perioperative period, also didn't strike us as something that would rise to the level of needing informed consent, because if the CVICU doctor determined that the patient did need the vancomycin, then there was no, there was no restriction for them to do so. Um, and so uh, the patients weren't necessarily told that they were part of a research protocol per se, although there was obviously open discussion about preserving kidney function. And in general, my recollection is that the families were very excited to hear that we were trying to be somewhat elegant and gentle in the post-operative care. Uh, the next question, is there a similar program in neonatology? Might be a little out of scope for whether either of you can answer, but there isn't one that I know of, but the protocol is being adopted for other populations. I know that our pulmonary artery reconstruction program is interested in it, um, and uh, we've certainly sent it and shared it with other centers um, and might say it more broadly based on the success, particularly when the revised version. Yeah, certainly, if, if there's interest, we're happy to meet with the interested party and sort of discuss what we've learned and how it could be adapted toward that population. Uh, the next question is how, or can you describe how a heart transplant candidate might be considered to be at low risk for AKI? 
Yeah, no, that's interesting. So most of our patients actually go into their transplants with normal renal function. So it's not necessarily a pre-transplant risk factor. Um, you know, one of the nice things about these kind of pathways is you can change your criteria. And so when we originally started it in 2017, we were only doing the renal protective pathway in patients we thought it were at increased risk, like single ventricles and VAD patients. Um, but because it was so successful, we broadened it to literally every transplant patient. So it wasn't really a matter of inclusion criteria. The major modification, which happened about two and a half years ago, was once we realized that even though we were looking at AKI in the first seven days, almost everybody who got it, got it in two days. And so what we decided was that if you didn't have AKI within 48 hours, that you probably weren't going to get it. And that whatever immeasurable risk you had from having a delayed ATG dose um, probably wasn't worth it because you were preventing something that has already not happened. And so you could then jump off the protective pathway and then go down kind of more of our standard pathway if you made it two days without AKI. Um, and so that was really the decision point rather than the pre-op status. And one last question, um, and then I think we're at time. How do you differentiate between the impact of the pathway and the Hawthorne effect as a result of having any pathway at all? That is such a good question. Uh, and I think the short answer to that is that you can't. Um, there are, uh, you know, the Hawthorne effect, as most of us know, is really the, um, <clears throat> that behaviors would be changed when people are observed doing those behaviors. And so the mere fact that somebody is being observed in doing those behaviors potentially changed behaviors. And so I would argue that that's part of the um, intent really of a clinical pathway is to drive behavior change. So maybe not in the intent and content that's specified by the clinical pathway, but in the socialization of it. I think one way you can start to look at um, and try to tease that out a little bit is you know, something that we try to do here is to look in some granularity at the content of the processes within the pathway and examine those in detail to understand what processes were changed and in what frequency and then learn from that system. But I think it's a really difficult thing to be able to say definitively if some of the reasons that we see change are due to actual pathway or the Hawthorne effect. It's a really interesting concept. It, it, was super, it was super interesting because it clearly happened. We started talking about renal protection in mid-2015, and then it took some time to develop the pathway, which we implemented in the summer of 2017. Um, and when we looked back at our AKI rates, they actually started to drop in 2016. And so just the discussion and the attention to kidneys before we adopted any pathway had an actually a pretty impressive effect on reducing kidney injury. And we discovered that our former surgeon, Dr. Maeda, was doing different things in the operating room. He became much more attentive to things like central venous pressure. And he just decided, oh, it sounds like kidneys are important to my partners. I better pay some more attention to it. And so we actually started to see improvement before the pathway began. And that made it hard to create a comparison group because we didn't want to cherry pick a really old historical co co uh, cohort. But if we used literally just the immediate prior era, which we did, we were including these patients who were getting sort of the informal renal protective protocol courtesy of our surgeon. And I still <laughs> hypothesize that had we gone to a slightly older, older cohort, we would have seen actually even a bigger effect than the one we did. I have um, certainly seen that effect in other clinical pathway development, which is, I think, a necessary outgrowth of the socializing of the pathways. And, and we don't care, I mean, as long as the kidney injury, as long as things got better, it doesn't really matter right. you know, from a research standpoint. So. Well, we're at time. And um, let me again thank you both for a very interesting presentation. And thank the audience for lots of great questions. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.